Hello, and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research. So exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And what I'm really wanting is for you to get your exercise information from the research experts rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Assistant Professor Kevin Marak from the University of Arkansas in the USA. Kevin is a rising star in muscle research. So he looks at muscle mass, what regulates muscle mass, how resistance training increases muscle mass. And also we talked today about muscle memory. So the fact that if you do exercise training and then you have a period of time where you don't exercise and then you exercise again, it appears that the muscle responds quicker the second time. So there's been some sort of muscle memory. So we talk about what is the evidence for muscle memory and how is it regulated? So at the muscle level, is it genetics? Is it epigenetics? Is it changes within the muscles, gene expression, et cetera? I found him a really fun guy to chat with. He's really on top of his field. I learned a lot. I think you will too. So stick around. If you'd like to do me a favor and also help spread the word about Inside Exercise, please like, comment, subscribe, et cetera, because then it makes it more likely if someone does a search about exercise that the algorithm will suggest Inside Exercise. Now, with all the podcasts, it's much better if you watch the whole podcast to get the full context. But if you'd like to jump around a little bit, um, for example, if we're talking about mechanisms and you'd rather skip over that, then you can look down at the, at the notes and you can see the timestamps are there. So it shows at each time what we're talking about. So you can skip around a little bit. Okay. So enjoy the chat. Hi, Kevin. How are you doing? Welcome to Inside Exercise. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm very excited. I appreciate the invite. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to have you on. You're, you're the, the, the second official sort of rising star. You've got an amazing track record for how long you've been around. We'll talk about that. So the first one was the, the great Carlos Alquin from uh, University of Copenhagen, who I met uh, a couple of times I was out there. So it was great. So people can look that up. But um, yeah, so we're going to talk about um, epigenetics. So we'll explain what that is and, and muscle memory and things like that. Um, but like I, what I like to do at the start is just sort of talk about how did you actually get in to exercise research to start with? Yeah, I mean, I was... Uh like many other people on this podcast was an athlete. No, I, I personally wasn't a very talented one, but uh, I played sports in college or in high school, not in college. I wasn't even that good. I played sports in high school, uh -huh. um, tennis, soccer, and I got into weightlifting. Um, then went off to college and, you know, continued kind of just uh, exercising for the sake of exercising. I enjoyed it. I, I specifically enjoyed lifting weights. So like kind of all my research reflects mm. back on that like i view everything through the lens of like you know weightlifting um so uh yeah but i really enjoyed that aspect of um of exercising and so in college you know start lifting weights more and start thinking more about you know how do my muscles grow like how does this process happen um just kind of became more of a personal interest but it was around that time i realized i could study exercise science as like a profession or as a major at that time but i didn't realize it could become a profession so i be you know studied exercise science at unc uh chapel hill in north carolina and then uh you know once i got that degree i didn't really you know know what to do with it <laughs> and so i decided to get a master's degree exercise physiology. And that was at James Madison University. I worked with a guy named Nick Luden, who had just graduated with his PhD from Ball State University. And uh, so he for James Madison, he said, you know, you should go to Ball State. That's where I went. I think you'd like it. So I, uh, you know, went and got my PhD at Ball State University. And, you know, at this point, I had, you know, started doing some different types of exercise, started riding the bike a little more, um, you know, road bike, things like that. Um, so I, you know, was, I guess, training concurrently, so to say. But um, so, yeah, but again, this interest in personal interest in exercise sort of evolved into more of an academic interest at mm -hmm. this point, you know, doing, as you know, muscle biopsy work and uh, single muscle fiber physiology, fiber typing, things like that. And mm -hmm. then uh, after, I, after I graduated from the HPL at Ball State, I went and did a six year postdoc with uh, Dr. Charlotte Peterson and Dr. John McCarthy. Um, so did a lot of more preclinical work, you know, looking with mice, doing a lot of cells, uh, genetically modified mouse models, really focused on muscle stem cells, satellite cells, uh, primarily. Yep, yep. And, and it was around that time I started kind of thinking more about epigenetics and aging and, and skeletal muscle, um, with exercise as well. So I started transitioning towards the end of that time into those areas, which is what I study now in my, uh, my own laboratory at university of Arkansas. So that's kind of like my, uh, my academic story arc, but it began with a personal interest and just kind of evolved into 
I can study muscle adaptation for a living. That's amazing. So I just kind of yeah. kept down that. <laughs> yeah. And you've been doing amazingly well. So I, I, I don't know, looking at Google Scholar, it looked like your first citations were sort of 2015 or something. Is that right? Um, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. yeah. About and nine when did years you, ago. When did you get your PhD? Um, uh, I finished in 2015. Yep. Yeah. So about that. So that's amazing because uh, you've got an H. I don't know if people know what an H index is. I've mentioned it here and there, but an H index is um, the number of times you've been cited per paper. So if you have an H index of one, you've got like one paper that's been cited once. You might have three papers, but you've had you know one citation right. for what for one paper. An H index of twenty is you've got like twenty papers that have been cited twenty times or more. You might have eight, 40 papers. You've got an H index on Google Scholar anyway, which is slightly more generous than, than Web of Science of 31 already. And you said something yeah. like, how many papers did you say you got during your postdoc? You know, um, I feel I think it was between, I want to say it was between 35 and 40. I don't know the exact number, but it was in that range. Um, I was, we were very productive at the University of Kentucky. Wow. Uh, uh -huh. and, and it was just me, of course, like it yeah. couldn't have been. Yeah, I, you know, I think That's I, I don't know how first author but a lot there was a lot of collaboration going on and so it's a very very rich environment for for productivity <laughs> yeah so you're doing great so as i said second rising i'd call officially a rising star and you said you just got a new investigator award uh, what was that one uh, yeah from the american physiological society for the like cell and molecular physiology section so a couple of nice folks nominated me and yeah so that's uh that's cool so i'll be at that conference in uh what, what, whenever it is, when is that conference? It's in April. So I'm going to go. To okay. That. <laughs> okay. Great. All right. So we're going to talk about um, epigenetics and muscle memory. So maybe we'll just talk a little bit about what epigenetics is uh, in a little bit, but if we just talk about this muscle memory concept, so it sort of gets you know banded around a little bit. Um, I guess lay people sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like saying, oh, I'm, you know, running to the, running to the bus and my legs are burning. It's the lactate, you know, it's like, <laughs> maybe, maybe not, you know, but so, so what is, what is muscle memory? And when people talk about that, and, and I guess it's a bit of a controversial term and, you know. Sure. Well, I think it controversial and, or has multiple meanings to different people mm -hmm. is, is probably both of those things. Um, yeah. A lot of people think when they say muscle memory, they take, I think probably the most, you know, immediate examples like riding a bike, they think, you know, oh, it's muscle memory because that's how I know how to ride a bike, even though I haven't ridden one in 20 years. And, um, you know, that's one possible kind of explanation or interpretation of what that means. Uh, that's probably more related to like, you know, um, neuromuscular or, or mm. neural patterning, things like that. That's more probably in the brain and spinal cord. When I think about muscle memory, I'm thinking more in like the muscle cell. So like in the muscle fibers themselves and basically changes, long-term changes that could potentially be happening in the muscle in response to a stimulus that make it perhaps more adaptive in the future based on what it was exposed to. So I think of it more as like a, a cellular phenomenon, so mm -hmm, to say, yeah. um, and maybe not so much. Uh, and it, it could, there could be a neural component to it as well. But I, I study more the, the cellular, the muscle cellular component of what muscle memory is. And I think like colloquially in the field, and when we say the term muscle memory as muscle biologists, we're saying like, uh, you know, maybe you resistance train once upon a time, then you stop resistance training for whatever reason, injury, COVID, whatever happens, you know, yeah. and then you start training again, that you're more sensitive to that training and you adapt again to that training more quickly. So, you know, what maybe took you eight weeks to gain muscle mass the first time, maybe it only takes you four the next time. And that's the, the quote unquote muscle memory. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's sort of the way that okay. I think yeah. about it. And that makes sense. Now, um, I guess, I guess I start to think now, I know you've, you've said you've done, uh, you know, we tend to say preclinical, so sort of, you know, my studies, rat studies, et cetera. Uh, uh, and I know you've mainly done that. I just wonder before we get into the nitty gritty of what you've done, because that's really interesting. I think it, it's, it sounds pretty convincing. I'm just wondering, ha has that really been looked at? Have people, you know, sort of, uh, looked at that very closely with humans, just this concept of, because as you say, um, it does feel like, you know, if you've done weight training before and you do it again, it's like, oh, I'm taking this better than I did the first time. But you sort of wonder, yeah. wonder oh, how much of that is just sort of maybe confidence because you sort of know what you're doing and all that. And 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 like you said, uh, and I like the, the fact you mentioned that, like, you know, you get on a bike 20 years later and you still know how to do it. That's not really the muscle. It's, it's sort of the the motor learning, the sort of coordinating the and, – and even again, it could be confidence, right? When you start to learn to ride a bike – you're, you're totally scared, right? You're going to fall over, you're crashing, you do it on the grass. The second time, you're more confident. So I, I guess, 
How much has that have, have that has been sort of looked at in humans? Do you know? Um, yeah, no, there there has been some. It's not like a rich literature at this point, I would say, but it's it is a, a topic that is interesting to some muscle biologists, and it has been studied in a couple different contexts in humans. You know, there was a, a study early on by like uh, Milena Lindholm, that's her name, yeah, and uh, C.J. Sundberg, uh, who's a Karolinska, where they did. Uh, a study where they like, had people, human beings come in and like endurance train and then looked at the detraining response and saw if there was like, you know, chain, long-term changes in gene expression and whether that could lead to, you know, a more adaptive response to retraining in the endurance training kind of realm. But I think in the resistance training realm, which is sort of where I reside, um, a guy named Adam Sharples, who is um, University mm -hmm. of Oslo now he i don't know if he, he hasn't been on the podcast i don't think i no, he hasn't but I, I've, his name's definitely been on the radar yeah 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 yeah. i would say reach out to him he'd be great um mm. and so um but yeah he did a study in the year I, it must have been in 20 i want to say 15 to 17 in that range so not even that long ago where they did a, a study where they had people come in and resistance train they would take biopsies before and um and after the training then they detrained them for a period of time and took biopsies and then retrained them and took biopsies again it was a really involved mm -hmm. study but they were probably one of the first ones in humans i believe the first ones in humans with the resistance training to show that yeah the, there is this sort of accelerated rebound response so if you had trained before and then you had gone back to your detrained state after training so you had lost your hypertrophy um in your muscle strength that once you start training again, it came back more quickly. And, th and they did show that using um, some different some different methods of looking at muscle size. And since that time, there's been a couple other studies uh, in the in the resistance training realm that have supported that too. But it's not it's not like a massive body of literature at this point. You know, it's more mm -hmm. kind of as you say, like there was this anecdotal observation amongst people that go to the gym, and then you know, mm -hmm. just start asking the question and doing real experiments to kind of tease it out a little more, but there is evidence for it. Um, it's just not a ton of it at the, at the moment because they're hard studies to do, right? As you know, like a, a training mm. study is hard to pull off and then you throw in detraining and retraining. Detraining. Like those are tough stuff. The same to people and ho hoping they don't drop out and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I guess I was thinking, it sounds like it hasn't been done, but I guess I was thinking, cause you're thinking mechanistic and I like that. I always think mechanistic, but I was just thinking yeah. if they'd, you know, looked at 10,000 people and asked them, you know, if you've done training and not, you know, without the mechanisms and all that sure. stuff. Sounds like yeah. no one's really done that. Um, I wouldn't think so. It, like no, a more no. kind of epidemiological study, so to say. Well, or even just, so. yeah, even just getting a bunch of people and just saying, um, just uh, do you have your records? So, so, so for example, it's more with endurance training, but you know, Strava, you know, yeah, do yeah, you know yeah. Strava? Or, yeah, I don't yeah, have so it, but I have it. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so I'm more like a cyclist type guy. So, and I always get injured. I've broken so many bones. So I mainly ride indoors. And I've got all the Strava data and all that. And they've started actually going back and looking at Strava data to see, oh, like, you know, people that, I don't know, ran 20 years ago, are they better now? Or, you know, so you could actually do that, I guess, if with endurance, you could see if people's running times, you know, that 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 had 10 years off and, you know, how quickly they got better and things like that. I, I guess I'm wondering about that. But it's also, I always think about endurance. So we'll get to endurance later as well. But yeah, it, 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 it sounds, it sounds, and, and when you talk about your mice data as well, it sounds definitely that there's something going on there. Um, so let's talk about that. So, so yeah, why don't we just talk a bit without getting too mechanistic, because I want to just sort of talk about, and then we'll get into the, the epigenetics and is it, you know, my nuclear junctions and, and uh, satellite cells and all that later. Uh, if you just talk about what you've done in the mice and what you found, and and also I guess it's, it's um, I'll be of interest how long that detraining is, um, you know. So sure. in the sharp uh, the study you spoke about in humans and also in your mice studies, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with the mice, I mean, I guess question or or hurdle number one with doing a mouse study with exercises getting a mouse to exercise, right? Of course, like yeah. that's, you have to have a model for that. And um, rats are a little bit more conducive to to training um, in an, I guess what I would call translatable way, um, mm -hmm. you know, like an act, like maybe some sort of like weightlifting or running wheel or something to that effect. But uh, my, mice are a little trickier. So our that's first true. challenge, our first challenge, yeah, they don't like to learn things. <laughs> really, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of operant condition going on with mice. And so, okay. um, so yeah, so we ended up, 
developing a new mouse model for exercise training and we called it progressive weighted wheel running um power for sure and Corey dungan one of my postdoc colleagues was really the one that kind of first put the mice on the wheels and 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 tested this out and then we adopted it uh as a laboratory at kentucky and okay. it's I, but basically it's uh, make a long story short we we put magnetic weights on the wheels in a very specific way so that they sort of have to resistance train while while running so it's voluntary for them but we found that when we train mice this way you know we just gave them these wheels um with the special weighting that um mm -hmm. they, they really took to it well and they they kind of became what i call athlete mice you know they're we measured their heart function their hearts got a lot bigger kind of an athlete's heart um so to say so like you know bigger left ventricle sort of thing mm -hmm. and uh and, but also their muscles got a lot bigger, um, their hind limb muscles specifically. So that was the first thing. So it's like, okay, now we have our training model. Um, that's good. So oh, sorry, just to be interject on that. So that's interesting. Yeah. Cause when I first saw in your paper about this, um, sort of resisted, uh, running wheel, it's, it's pretty interesting because you don't normally think of that. So it's almost concurrent training. Yeah. So they're doing yeah. when they're running it's hard. So it's like, cause it's hard to imagine a human, you'd have to run up a treadmill that's so steep to actually get hypertrophy as well as, you know endurance responses um and that is a a method that some people use is uphill high intensity treadmill running um there are some groups that do that and um yeah that that is one way to do it um but what we like our, our real running it's voluntary it's not forced they yes. both have different disadvantages like you have more control with the running and you know we no, can talk i think it's great i think it's a great model yeah the the voluntary yes. real running is um yeah and the fact they do it they choose to do it as well and they do it enough to get actually you're saying cardiovascular responses so sort of endurance type responses and they get hypertrophy yeah Most right? certainly. Yeah, yeah their muscles get bigger and their hearts get bigger and um yeah you know mouse fiber types are an interesting conversation as far as like yeah, what yeah. do they become or oxidative these different things but yes it seems like there's an app there's a fiber type switch in a in a kind of a more a slower direction and um you know the type of things you'd expect to see if you if you train but yeah it's, it is this kind of combination sort of concurrent mm. approach where hey, yeah can, sorry can i just interject yeah, again yeah, can on. i ask yeah. um because i know i know people have done because i never forget seeing this picture in a, in a journal article where they got rats to do squats have you seen right. that they, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. so they got them to sort of stand up and they had this weight and they got them, they had to was it they had to uh, get down to eat and then they had to lift up or something and yeah. maybe maybe you can explain that a bit but i was wondering why um because you're interested mainly in strength why did you not go with um something that was more strength rather than concurrent i'm just wondering about that sure well at the time this when I was postdoc. So this was, you know, between 2009 and 2015. So at that time, there wasn't, other than like what we call synergist ablation, which is a surgical model and um, for studying muscle growth. And that has advantages and disadvantages too. But there wasn't really uh, uh, anything out there at the, that was really, other than like electrical stimulation of the muscle, mm -hmm. of the mice, we have to like anesthetize them and do all these things. Um, so the the wheel running, was, it just made sense because we had running wheels and- uh, we, That's we, we were just, mm -hmm. and It was sort of, it was a little bit of a, um, a, a convenience thing, but at the same time, it ended up working out better than we would have expected. But um, But since that time, there have been other models that have been developed that are, more resistance kind of specific. Like uh, there's one by Zen Yan's group where they have like, there's food up above them. They have to push up against oh, yeah, the, I saw that the one. cage and they grab the food. And so, but food is a reward. Yeah, in that yeah, food. yeah. And so that's Yours but, is um, voluntary. Mm -hmm. and, and no, I, I like it. I like it. But I, I I guess I'm kind of ahead of, so I'm just thinking, ah, oh, if you did pure resistance training or pure weight training, would you get similar findings? But yeah, just, just keep going. Sure. It's, it's, oh no, yeah. it's a very valid question. There mm -hmm. is another model out there now that Troy Hornberger developed that is very much more just resistance training, but it's also very, I, I guess I'll say labor intensive. It, like you have to train each, each mouse, like kind of, you can train them simultaneously, but you have to like, it's like training people. You have to have somebody there to do things. Whereas this is like, they just get on the wheel, yeah, they yeah, do yeah. their thing. You know? No, I think so, it's great. Okay. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> That was, mm -hmm. you know, way too much explanation for how to exercise a mouse. So anyway, um, we exercise the mice, right? So, and that works and that's great. And then the next question for us was, well, you know, what happens when we detrain them? You know, are they going to lose the muscle mass, lose the adaptations? That was the first question. And if they do, if we retrain them, mm -hmm. will they gain that muscle mass back more quickly? So that was, that was the first study we did. We introduced yep. the model and then we, we basically just stopped the mice from running after eight weeks. We just clipped the wheels and they just okay. hung out in the cage 
And, you know, they, there was a detraining response, at least in some of the muscles, um, which was some didn't detrain, others did. So how long? So eight weeks, uh, eight weeks voluntary wheel running. And then how long did you detrain? We did, uh, oh boy, you're, you're, pu you're pushing me here. I gotta remember. Eight oh, you weeks got too many training. papers. You can't remember them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> eight weeks of training. And then I believe uh -huh. it was eight, eight weeks of detraining. Okay. Um, and then in one of my, and that was the first series of studies it was just the, the training and then the D training, just to mm -hmm. look at that response. And then we followed yeah, yeah. up eight weeks training, eight weeks D training, followed by four weeks of retraining. So like retraining. a shorter, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that was the original set of studies that we did. And the first couple just focused on the training, D training, then we added in the retraining component. Hey, you know, so, one, one thing I might say, cause people won't necessarily know this is, um, you know, there'll be sort of thinking about, oh, how does that relate to me, you know, as, as a human? And maybe just sure. explain a little bit how about about how eight weeks for a rodent is kind of like a, a long, longer percentage of their lifespan sort of thing. So because, you know, I've, I've often, you know, we talked off before I came on that I've done some studies in, in rats with where, that may have some sort of epigenetic um, interest. And people say, oh, yeah, but that's, you know, that's only a six-month-old rat. And I say, yeah, but that's like a four-year-old ch uh, child. So. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, you do have to contextualize it within you know the lifespan of that organism, and so for a mouse or a rat, for instance, you may get twenty four months out of their lifespan, two years or so, depending. Um, you can go more than that, but you know, at least in our hands, that's about getting close to the man. That's like uh, sixty five or seventy years in a human being, the equivalent of twenty four months. So yeah, if you train a mouse for eight weeks, that's like a significant proportion of their lifespan, <laughs> and yeah. so. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that, that duration of training and detraining is relatively quite long, even though it's like a normal training duration for a study you might read, you know, where they use college students or whatever, it's a semester, right? Eight weeks so, or 12 or 12 weeks. So, um, so yeah, it is important to keep that in mind where the, the time scales yeah, sort of yeah. should be adjusted on how long the life of the mouse is. So, or the, the rat. Yeah. 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 All good right. point. Very good point. No, it's good because yeah, people might be thinking, oh, if I do eight weeks, I'll get this and that, and then if I do four weeks, I'll get this and that. But it, I guess that's why eventually you, you need the translation. But it's very important. So I've I've done the same as you, where well, I literally did the same as you, <laughs> did my masters at Paul State, and then but but yeah. you know, starting off doing human stuff and then doing more animal work, you can look at mechanisms, but then go, oh, can I apply this to the humans? Yeah. So so why don't you tell us what you found then? So eight weeks of training, or or even if you, if it's more the the follow up one. So I saw your study here, muscle memory. Um, and that was in mice. Why yep. don't you tell us what you're finding generally with this training, detraining, training again to, to muscle fiber types and, and their strength and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, when we train the mice for eight weeks, we see hyper, we look at the hind limbs, right? So we're looking kind of at the, the calf muscles, so to say. Um, mm -hmm. And so we find that the muscles, pretty much all of them, we have like a fiber type transition towards what would be considered a, a slower twitch phenotype. So theoretically more fatigue resistant. Um, and then we see a lot of growth. We see growth of different muscle groups in the, the hind limb, but then we detrain the mice. Some of the muscles will atrophy and their fiber type will change back to like their untrained condition within those eight weeks. Um, some muscles won't though, which was interesting to us. Mm. Um, like the soleus, which is a more, well, at least in humans, more postural, um, type of muscle. It's, it's, you know, very fatigue resistance, a lot of slow, slow twitch fibers. Um, at least in the mouse, it, it has a similar sort of phenotype. I, I suppose you could say it's smaller, it's different in a variety of ways, but fiber type wise, um, you know, it's, it has some slow twitch fibers in there. And um, that didn't actually detrain after like eight yeah. weeks. And, even out, and then we, we extended it out, I think to 16 weeks in the follow-up study. And we saw that the soleus didn't really detrain, which we thought was interesting. Mm. Um, Still to this day, don't have an excellent explanation for that. They did put on yeah, some that, weight after the yeah. training, almost as if uh -huh. eating more during training. And I think they continued to eat more after training. And then they put on some body weight and that might've been loading the soleus mm. to help kind of keep it trained perhaps. But nevertheless, the more fast twitch type muscles, like the plantaris, they atrophy back to their kind of starting point and their fiber type switches back and things like that. And so that's what we see there. And so then that gave us impetus to go and retrain them and specifically look at the plantaris muscle since it went kind of back down to its original size to see if it kind of got bigger faster. So when we yeah. retrain them, it was for four weeks. So we originally trained them for eight, washed mm -hmm. them out for a period of time, then just trained them for a short period of time. And the comparator there was just a naive mouse that 
didn't do anything except train for that four weeks. And as same well. age. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep. And so, so when we retrained, we found that the muscles grew about 10% more um, with that retraining. And so that was kind of the, the, the global responses to like the muscle mass and things like that. Um, okay. And then we found some differences at the muscle fiber level as well, as far as like fibers that were growing and getting bigger, um, relatively more than the group that hadn't trained before. So there was some evidence for this muscle memory kind of um, thing going on in our mice, which has been shown before in humans too. And so, um, so that kind of gave us some motivation to, to, to dig a little deeper and try to see if there was perhaps an explanation for that. Okay. So yeah, if I just sort of summarize, make people, make sure people are clear, because we sort of say fast switch, slow twitch, and I, you did a good job explaining it, you know, the more fatigue resistant, but yeah, just make sure people are clear. So, so as, as, as you said, um, the slow twitch fibers are more sort of fatigue resistant. So you tend to think of that more with people that are good endurance uh, athletes. Yep. So often we do, we biopsy the vastus lateralis, which is the quadriceps, but the one on this, on the outside. And, you know, the average person might be 50-50, but you'll see on average an endurance-trained athlete that's, that's that's good. You know, you might be endurance-trained, but not very good. Um, a oh, good yeah. endurance-trained person will, might be like 70% slow twitch, so more fatigue-resistant, not so good at sprinting, that won't produce as much lactate and things like that. And then a sprinter will be sort of the other way around. They'll tend to have maybe 70% fast twitch fibers. Um, they fatigue very quickly, but they produce a lot of force. And um, that's what you want, right, as a sprinter. So just to make sure people are clear on that. Now, you're saying that in your uh, – my, this is mice, yeah? In your in your mice, when they've done your resisted wheel running for um, eight weeks generally, they get – they they're getting hypertrophy, so bigger muscle size, yeah? Mm-hmm. Some of their muscles yeah. are getting bigger. And yep. you're finding when you detrain them, uh, so when they stop training, you literally lock the wheel that the slow fibers, so those more fatigue resistant, the ones that the endurance trained people tend to have, they actually tend to not detrain. They tend to stay about the same. And the fast fibers um, more tend to go back to what they were, yeah, which is yeah. really interesting, as you say, really interesting and surprising. And uh, I'm still like, hang on. Uh, and and you said even when you wait, like 16, did you say 16? 12 or 16 weeks because we originally, I think we yeah. originally did an eight-week detrain and then we saw uh-huh. the solely did an atrophy and we thought that's yeah. curious get a whole other cohort of mice which takes yeah. forever Think about it. you know you train them you detrain them all these things yeah, yeah, and yeah. after 12 or 16 weeks i really should go back Still and look hadn't, at yeah no it's fine so, so yeah and which we say which is probably as you said as we talked about it's, it's it kind of hard to compare but if anything it'd be longer in a human you know that's a long time in a, in a mouse um so that's really interesting. But the other thing you said was that they tended to get a bit of a trans a, a, a um, switching of their muscle fibers anyway. So when you train them with this resisted wheel training, they tended to get some conversion of their slow, uh, sorry, for, of their faster type muscles to slow muscles. So they're getting more slow muscle uh, fiber types, and those slow muscle fiber types don't tend to detrain. So Tolius, um, that was, that was true. But in the plantaris, we're still shifting. Like when we train them, the mice, the plantaris muscles more, you know, type 2A, 2B and 2X. Humans don't uh-huh. really to 2B, but we have the 2X in so, usually yeah. Fast. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, you know, but usually any type of training, whether it's resistance or endurance mm-hmm. training, you'll move away from having those really fast sort of fibers to more homogeneous or either 2A in this mm-hmm. case the Harris. And that's exactly what we saw when we power trained the mice. We start losing the two B's and X's. Uh, okay. more t- All right. Yep, yep, yep. We shifted back more to, towards two B and X's when the plantaris. Um, ah, yes. What, uh, what train. Yep. Okay. That's great. So that, that's actually a good little segue to, to mention to people that they might want to listen to the excellent chat that I had with um, Will Darabe. Um, yeah. Who, I who, that one. That was really good. I enjoyed yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if they want to understand more about this business, so basically what he's saying there is um, what Kevin's saying is the soleus muscle is mainly slow fibers. And then the um, the um, plantaris muscle is mainly uh, fast fibers, but they're a lot of, they've got, um, so you've got fast 2A, which is more sort of aerobic, um, but still fast. And then 2B and 2X, which as you go and have a look at um, Will, uh, Wim Darabe's chat to talk about, you know, what, what there is in, in 
rodents versus humans. But basically, yeah, it's really interesting that whether you do endurance or strength training, you tend to lose your two Bs or two Xs. And they switched more to two As. So becoming a little bit more sort of slowish sort of phenotype. Slower relatively, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and more aerobic sort of thing. And um, anyway, so basically whether whether you're talking about your fast twitch muscle, which is which is your plantaris, which is more fast twitch, or your, or your soleus, things are becoming more slow, more sort of aerobic, yeah? And is that Very even safe. within the plantaris? Because, uh, sorry, within the soleus, because I know in humans and, and rodents, the, the soleus is a little bit different. Um, the humans tend to be like almost all slow, and I think in, in mice it's maybe 50-50, but you're saying you're getting more slow, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Like with the, with the power training, we saw a shift. Well, the soleus, as you say, in the mouse is more 2A and type 1, like 50-50-ish, we'll just say. Mm -hmm. And then you start seeing a shift more towards type 1. The thing is, like, and this is just an ongoing conversation in the muscle community, is like, you know, looking at fiber type as far as its twitch profile and fiber yeah. type its oxidative profile, yeah. they don't always match up perfectly because no. in the mouse, the two A's tend to be very oxidative, even more so than the type ones in many occasions. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes it a little bit tricky. Um, oh, okay. So let's make it, keep it simple as, as the way you had it. And I've now sort yeah, of complicated yeah, yeah. it, but yeah, it's basically you become more type one ish, whether it's type ones or two A's or something, you become more sort of aerobic um, with yeah, the training. Point. Now, I guess that makes me think, because I know I know we're we're going to talk about muscle memory, but just the, the actual training itself, it makes me think that the training, they're actually getting quite a lot of the um you know, the aerobic sort of stimulus from the from the running on the treadmill. It's not just the the hypertrophy, which is um do you oh, think certainly. if they were just doing the weight, do you think if they were just doing the say say the squat, whether yeah. they'd get that sort of response or not? I don't think you'd see that radical of a fiber type trait. You would, see, mm. I think, see a loss of your more 2B and X. Yeah, probably exactly. those hybrid fibers. You may not see that full transition over um, yeah, towards yeah. having potentially more ones or exactly. a much larger extension um, of ones. But yeah, uh, I, I don't think you'd see that, that same result. No. The endurance component is playing a factor exactly. here. And, you know, they're running anywhere between eight and 12 kilometers a night when you're using younger female mice. And that's a lot. That, <laughs> you know, most... that is really impressive because we've done studies with, with rice, mice and rice, mice and rats, you can buy them and get rice. Um, <laughs> and yeah, eight to 10 kilometers a day is, 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 to, is what they tend to do. And they're tiny. So it's, again, if you think about that for human, it's like running you know, three marathons a day, but um yeah, but uh, they're actually doing that even with the resisted wheel. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. Well, that was the beauty of the wheel that we accidentally sort of, um, Corey, Dr. Dungan, my colleague, he, we, at the time, all we had were these metal running wheels and, you know, to buy a, uh, they make special running wheels that are weighted running wheels where it's like a brake that you put on the wheel and you gradually increase the the friction with the brake on the wheel. But then they get to a point where they can't even move the wheel. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah stop running whereas we put the weights just on one side of the wheel and it made it kind of like lopsided and so uh, it facilitated them running very high volumes um still with a lot of weight on the wheel up to like 20 percent of their body mass on the wheel they would still run this amount and so that was sort of the secret sauce with the uh with okay. the model to get it to work right. yeah so okay. it was actually not like it was something we had necessarily planned it's just that, that was what All was right. available what we yeah did. great All right <laughs> So the yeah. muscle memory part, okay, which is the, <laughs> I keep getting caught up on these details because I love all this stuff. Yeah, um, all right. So the muscle memory bit, all right. So you're saying about 10, so you're saying when they did the same, well, actually, okay, here's a question. Okay. Hang on. So they got about 10% greater hypertrophy when you did it the second time than the first time. So you're saying that's the muscle memory bit because they've re responded quicker, but were they doing the same amount of, because the, one of the yep. the great thing about voluntary wheel running is it's voluntary and you're not having to stimulate them and they're choosing it off their own accord. So they're not getting the stress. You know, they get a lot of stress. If you put a, put a mouse or a rat on a treadmill, you're making it run If you, plus or minus electrical stimulation. We, we don't do that here. We, we just blow air on them. But anyway, yeah. it's stressful. They hate it. Okay. So then you get the cortisol and adrenaline and all that stuff, which is not real life. And it's, and then you wonder how much of your findings of the stress response and how much of the training and all this crap. So when what voluntary wheel running, you haven't got that. So it's fantastic. And I'm a huge fan of it, but yeah, I'm just wondering, it's also a bit difficult to match the training though. So did they do the same training the second time? 
fortunately, yes. Um, in our in our in that particular group, they did, which was great. And I mean, if you do a big enough group of my, I mean, these again, these are hard studies to do, and they take a lot of time and resources and money and all these things. But um, if you had a large enough um cohort, you could also kind of like match them one for one as far as their volume goes. So you're going to have a range of volumes, and the, they're yeah. not all just going to run exactly ten, right? Like no. you're going to get a range. Absolutely. And so on average, the ones that had trained pre. Obviously, that train again, they ran just about the exact same amount Perfect. as the ones that were naive, which worked out Perfect. great because I was very concerned mm -hmm. about this too. And I think it was like ends of six per group at that point. Um, and so I was very concerned that like, oh, they're, yeah. they're all run way more because they, they had already been exposed to the wheel. They remember Perfect. it. They're going to hop on, just get right to mm -hmm. it. Um, but fortunately, the mice typically take pretty quickly to the running wheel. Um, in my experience, usually after a couple of days, they, they kind of oh, figure yeah. it out. Um, mm -hmm. within a week, they almost always do. And so, um, and we give them a week of acclimation too, just to like, for them to get back in their, back in the groove, <laughs> so to say. So, uh, so they did run the same amount. That's, That's fantastic. Very, great question. Uh, it's an important mm -hmm. question because they ran different volumes. What yeah. do you attribute hypertrophy to, right? Exactly. So, yeah. And you got, and you got about 10%, uh, um, more hypertrophy on average, which is, which is yeah. not massive, but it's obviously came up significant with you with you and yeah yeah and it's not massive but it's also not i mean when humans resistance train like you're not going to see a doubling of muscle size in a matter of weeks like you sometimes do with like surgical models of of hypertrophy for mice um so it was more akin to like maybe what you'd start to see if somebody was resistance training and oh, so, sorry sorry i thought you meant 10 percent different um no they, they gain 10 percent. yeah they, they gain 10 percent more than the than the 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 naive yeah, groups yeah. that right, region yeah. Yep, so. yep, yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So what? I just out of interest, how much of a hypertrophy are we are we getting? So so when you do the the first time, do they get a I don't know what percent? And then you know how much are we comparing? Um, yeah, we're talking about like I guess we'll just talk about in terms of mass, mass. like the coleus. Mm -hmm. I think uh, twenty to twenty five percent, and the plantaris is like. 15 to 20, I think the soleus gets a little more activated with the running, which I think makes sense because it's, you know, going to be uh, a muscle that's responsible for plantar flexion. The plant, the plantaris does that too, but mm -hmm. um, the soleus definitely gets, uh, gets a pretty good amount of stimulation from this type of running. So yeah, about, I would say 25% on the soleus and maybe like 15 to okay. 20 on the plantaris. So just so. to make sure we're clear, cause I'm slightly confused. So, so soleus got a 25% increase in muscle size. Yeah. The first time. And then when you said it got 10% more, are you saying it got 27.5%? Oh, okay. So, so let's talk about the plantaris for this because okay. the soul retrain. So the retraining data was. Oh, yeah. yes. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. You're right. The plantaris, um, I, you know, it's a good question. I'd have to see exactly. I'd have to go back to, because they didn't, it was only a four week training. So mm -hmm. typically when you, when we power train the mice, we're just barely starting to see significance with hypertrophy yeah, exactly. four mm -hmm. weeks in the naive state. Right. So Absolutely. they're just starting to grow by four weeks. So it's a very, mm -hmm. so I would say that if memory is serving, they were probably like, they probably grew like 13 or 14% or something in that four mm -hmm. week. And maybe the, the naive only grew a couple percentage, right. Yeah. Um, because relatively yeah. short term. So uh, maybe that, hopefully that clears it up, but, um, but yeah, so basically okay. so it's quite naive, yeah, the night mice didn't really grow all that much in the first four weeks. Yeah, yeah. Hypertrophy. Oh, that's substantial then. Okay, okay. Starting okay. to get it, and then yeah. So it was yeah, I was thinking you were saying ten percent. So if you went from up, up, if you increased by forty percent, then the second time you'd increase by forty four percent. You know, ten percent oh, no, more. I probably, no, no, I probably you, spoke. So no, no, yeah. no, that's good. No, that's a lot then. That's a lot. So you're saying it's actually substantially more the second time with the the muscle memory side of things. And the I think the remaining question is like. You know, is it that they'll just they just hypertrophy more quickly, or they'll ultimately hypertrophy exactly. more? Sort exactly. of the opinion that they would just hypertrophy, they would just get to their plateau faster, right? So maybe by eight weeks, they the muscle mass would be the same between the naive and the the um, exactly the previously trained group. It's just they had a, a steeper curve or a steeper. That, that was what I was going to ask you, but I guess you haven't had a chance to look at that yet. Um, you haven't no, looked at um, uh, the time course. We didn't retrain them out to eight weeks because for our initial question, we really just wanted to see, do they grow back faster? And we that was what we were scared of. If we went out to eight weeks, we might have missed our time. We might have plateaued already. Yeah, mm. exactly. And so we're like, okay, we'll do half the time. It's and, really nice. Um, yeah. It's nice so. stuff. All right. So I can't let you go without this. Uh, why do the slow twitch not, um, the soleus, why do they not? 
Okay, so I'm sure you've looked at a lot of things in here uh, in the muscles. So is it that they didn't hypertrophy? So I'm just trying to get my head around how it is 12, 16 weeks that this that you stop that you do the detraining and they don't detrain the soleus, yeah. so the, the one that's more slow fiber, for, slow phenotype, even though it's a bit of both. Um, what, hang on. So what did, didn't they do? <laughs> Sorry. So did they not hypertrophy? Did they not uh, change their fiber type back again? Did they not do anything? I know you measured microRNA and all sorts of things. Did nothing really change? So when we train them for the eight weeks, the soleus again will grow pretty substantially. Let's just say 25%. I don't know. It's, it's in that range um, from baseline. And so, but yeah, when we looked eight and I believe it was 12 or 16 weeks, 12, we'll just say after the, we stopped them from running, yeah. everything we looked at, at least histologically everything. was just the same. Like the fiber type, you know, they picked up more type one fibers and during the training and they retained those for the D training. They, fiber, wow. Their fibers got bigger and they just didn't go back to being smaller wow. and they gained more myonuclei. So muscle fiber nuclei from the satellite cells, which we can talk about. They picked those up during the training too. And then they didn't lose them didn't during lose the D training. Wow. Yeah, okay. So it was like a, just a universal, like they just whatever they got during the training, they just kept. And they also, again, put on body mass during the, the D training. They said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it has something to do with I don't okay. know, I call it like the college athlete effect, right? Like you're super fit in college, you're eating all this food to support your mass and to support mm. your athleticism. And then you get out of college and you stop performing at the super high level and you continue. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. But I think we have to say in humans, you, you don't get this. So if we forget about the muscle memory, if we just look at humans that have done weight training or endurance training, and then you, they detrain, I think it's fair to say you don't, get you wouldn't this or generally. you wouldn't keep the muscle mass. You wouldn't keep the fiber type changes and things. Do you think is that, so is that a species? What do we make of that? I guess. Yeah. it's. It, I've thought about it, of course. And, you know, I, it's hard for me to make heads or tails of it, but I guess one thing I could say is that like, it probably depends very much on the muscle and the fiber type percentage and probably just the the function of the muscle that you're looking at. When you think about the, the soleus, for instance, like if people, put on Most fat mass, mm -hmm. they, they get larger, they eat a lot and they become, yeah, you know, yeah, obese yeah. Or whatever. A lot of times their leg muscles, their calves specifically will get be. bigger. Yeah. yeah. And so it could be, and that's probably mostly soleus because the postural muscle and it's just being loaded heavier and heavier every single step for their whole lives. And so, yeah, I guess it would make sense. That's that a fair would, point. That's a fair point. Because when we, that. when I talk about humans, so if you did go back and look at every human study that's ever looked at training and fiber type changes and whatever, almost all the training stuff that's been done in humans has been the, the, um, the vastus lateralis, which is, mm -hmm. which is, you know, again, the quads, which is not really a strictly a postural muscle. And then if you do look at uh, runners, you often biopsy the um, calf, mm -hmm. but it's the gastroc. It's not the soleus. Yeah. People, more and more people do look at the soleus now. So I think that's, that's a good fair point. I, I guess I'm willing to, uh, to pay that because soleus is like, as you say, a postural muscle. So, so these muscles that are closer to the bone, that sort of deep muscles, not the superficial ones tend to be postural. So, you know, we're talking about walking around and things like that. So yeah, it's possible that, 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 that there may be changes that, that, you know, I guess it hasn't really, really been looked at that much in humans, I guess. Yeah. Like training and then detraining and looking at the soleus. No, I don't think so. Um, if it's out there that I, it's probably more in the context of endurance training, we're talking about resistance here. And so, and um, yeah, I mean, the soleus is at least for the uh, human beings for their low, it takes up a good, I think it's the bigger muscle of the calf so not, than the, mm -hmm. than the gastroc. I think it's bigger, um, but it lays underneath, you know, the gastroc. And so it's a little harder to access. And when you biopsy it, as you probably know, you go in from the side, um, you know, you have people laying mm -hmm. on their stomach going from the side. I think I had one of those when I was at Ball State, even a soleus. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did. I, I don't remember. I had a lot. <laughs> you know, it's a classic. I can't say this without. So we're talking about Ball State, right? So I was at Ball State and and um, it was fantastic. So people, if they haven't, haven't had a look, they need to have a look at David Costell's chat with me. Uh, it's the longest one so far. And I just love that guy. Anyway, so he was, you know, he is Ball State basically until he left, he finished. And then Scott Trappy, your supervisor, took over. But anyway, I have to say, hey, you might, you might, might, might not like me saying this, but he told me how he biopsied himself one day. He, um, yeah. yeah, he stood, <laughs> stood there, put his put his leg up against the chair and biopsied his calf. 
<laughs> he didn't do a soleus as far as I know. But anyway, I, yeah, that's that's yeah, fun. But yeah, uh, that mm. sounds like something Doc would do. <laughs> yeah, it's great stuff. All right, so but, if we start thinking about mechanisms then, yes? So maybe if we can talk about, um, you know, you've touched on satellite cells and things like that. Maybe if we just talk about, because seeing as the title of this one is epigenetics uh, and muscle memory, we just talk about you know genetics versus epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Just a bit of a background. We've talked about it before on the podcast, but people may not have seen it. And and you know what we're getting at here because it used to just be everything was genetics, right? Charles Darwin, yeah. genetics. There's no nothing else. And now we're thinking more about epigenetics as well, epigenetics and genetics. So do you want to just sure. explain that a little bit? Yeah, I think like in layman's terms, I guess the way I would think about epigenetics versus genetics is like genetics is like can you express the gene and epigenetics is like will you express the gene you know like mm. so it's a it's a it's changing gene expression without an alteration to the genetic code so it's like yeah we have all these genes like all of us have these genes and they get turned on and turned off in response to various things but what controls largely that turning off and turning on of of genes is the epigenetic layer, which is the things that are kind of either impeding or making the genes available to be expressed. And so that's really kind of what we're talking to more about kind of a regulatory layer on top of genetics that when we're, we're thinking about genetics versus epigenetics, we're, you know, just a lot, a lot of times thinking about epigenetics being the intent. So like, is the gene going to be expressed? Um, so turning it off and turning it on, we have it, but it needs to be turned off or turned on. The epigenetic layer kind of controls that. And it comes in a lot of different flavors, like talking about histone modifications and, and DNA methylation. And some might even qualify at microRNAs as, as part of that conversation. Uh -huh. And so, so yeah, it's uh, that that's the way I, I'm thinking about epigenetics is what's controlling whether a gene gets expressed. Exactly. But can I also add another layer? So the Charles Darwin type thing is... um. The classic thing, which is, you know, if a giraffe has a long neck, you know, is it because it's been reaching up its whole life or is it because, you know, the father and the mother had long necks and then it got passed on? And the other thing about epigenetics is you can actually pass it on. So so it's the controlling during a lifetime, but also, um, you know, things that you do during a lifetime can be passed on, even though the genes themselves aren't changed, the likelihood of them being expressed in the next generation is passed on. So yep. I just wanted to make uh, bring out that distinction. So people might want to see um, Laurie Goodyear's chat on here. Um, and I've done some work on that as well, where, where you can, for example, have a, so we did like a high fat fed father. And then, you know, the offspring is more likely to get diabetes. And then she's even looked at the next, uh, next generation now. Yeah. So, so that has to, to be epigenetics. <laughs> exactly. It has to be epigenetics because you haven't changed the genes. So, but as you say though, also during your lifetime, so an example, or that 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 sometimes you think about is is people that have uncontrolled diabetes, so they've got elevated glucose for twenty years or something, and then they control it really perfectly for the next twenty years. They still have worse outcomes than you know than people that have had um, good control, uh, good control the whole way. So it's like okay, something happened early in life, earlier in their life, which is still having an effect later. Yeah, is that fair to say? Those sort of yeah. distinctions. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And no. I, I mean, I think about it in that context, mostly with exercise, you know, like I'm talking about what's happening within your lifespan, what's happening in your exactly. somatic cells within your muscle cells, so not like your germ cells. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's definitely how I'm thinking of things. But it's the opposite. Like you're thinking about diabetes and yeah. perhaps bad outcomes. And I'm trying to think about more about good outcomes, like good exercise. Outcomes. Good. What are the good things that it's that it's that it's you know imprinting so, or something into your uh, your epigenetic code to to make it beneficial throughout your whole life, even if you stop doing it, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Well, we, we actually well, it's not about my stuff, but we actually did a thing. Of, if you were born, if a rat was born small, or if the father had high fat diet, you exercise the offspring from just five weeks to nine weeks of age, and you fixed a lot of their problems. So that was yeah. really cool. Yeah, so it's Love really that. cool. But <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, exercise is great. Couldn't, couldn't let that one go. So yeah, so you're talking about here a situation where they they do the exercise, they get an adaptation, they detrain, and then they train again, and they get a quicker or we don't know if it's quicker, I guess, but a greater uh, response. And 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 how do you tie that in maybe with epigenetics? Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, I think. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about like the the cellular foundations of what muscle memory is thought to be, which, you know, there was a lot of work done in 2010-ish in that, that time frame, early before and after that, um, 
a couple of years, but uh, a guy named uh, Christian Gunderson, who kind of laid the foundation for our knowledge okay. in this and for like kind of well, what's what what causes muscle memory? And he did a whole series okay. of different studies using mice and rats, looking at the number of nuclei in the muscle fiber, right? Because muscle fibers are multinuclear. They're not mononuclear cells like most of the cells in our body. They're these long cylinders and they have hundreds to thousands of nuclei in them. And those nuclei are thought to not divide. Um, whether post mitotic mm -hmm. or you know, whether they can synthesize DNA. You had Benjamin Miller on here, so he talked about that, I'm sure. But um, but yeah, whether or not they can divide and replenish themselves, I think is pretty established that they can't do that. And so, um, but you can pick up, you can gain more nuclei within a given muscle fiber from your stem cells. And usually when the muscle fiber grows, a stem cell will become activated and it'll fuse into the muscle fiber and add a new Okay, nuclei. just go, sorry, just go a little bit slower. So this is, so, if, sure. it's kind of hard <laughs> stuff. So yeah, just, you're saying that, that, that most <laughs> cells... So if you look at your cells in your gut or whatever, they'll have one nucleus, yeah, that contains the DNA. And you're yeah, saying like the, the our muscle cells, yeah. skin cells and our muscle yeah. cells, you say, have hundreds of thousands? Hundreds to thousands, yeah. Like, That's right, um, yeah. I thought that made more sense. I thought you said hundred, hundred, yeah. hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah, yeah hundreds yeah, to thousands of, of nuclei. So more. Than, so yeah. it's really interesting. So each cell that contains all your DNA, yeah, so each nucleus that contains all the DNA, for your body is is replicated many times within the one muscle cell. Yes. And then you're saying um, this replenishing them and things like that. So maybe just go there, but just go a bit slower and um, okay, and, and then yeah, say yeah. what happens so, with resistance training and things like that. Yep. Yep. Sure. Okay. So, so within the muscle fiber is going to be many nuclei. So all of the copies of the DNA, there's numerous nuclei that mm -hmm. have an individual copy of you know, all your DNA in each one of those. Whereas a normal cell, a skin cell, an eye cell, whatever, is just one small cell that has one nucleus in it. So it just has like one complete copy of your DNA. Yep. The muscle fiber, on the other hand, might have hundreds or thousands of nuclei, which means it has hundreds or thousands of copies mm. of your 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 DNA, which is crazy. It's called a syncytium. And so it's, you know, just, uh, it's multinuclear. And so mm. all these nuclei are having to work in concert to regulate this. This is amazing to think about. Yeah, yeah, and usually voluminous, I guess, uh, the uh, big volume, the cells have big volume. They're very, very large cells. I mean, a muscle fiber, you, you if you pull out an individual muscle fiber, you can like see it with your eye, whereas like an individual skin cell, you can't do that. Like these, these muscle fibers are massive and they have lots of nuclei and it's thought that these nuclei are what help support their, their size. Um, you okay. know, cause if you only have one nucleus for a, what I'll call a super massive cell, it probably mm. wouldn't be able to control the entire cell. It would, you yeah, know, it probably yeah. the cell would die or it would be very inefficient. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, it's a really unique, one of the thing, one of the very many cool things about muscle is the fact that it's this big, each fiber is a, each cell is a big multinuclear sensation. It's, it's, it's funny though, because when we're talking about these big cells, it, I still want people to understand how small these things are. So for example, when you have a muscle biopsy, which we talked about, and I've had 33 of them, you, you're taking wow. out, we, we often say like two or three rice grains size, you know, sure. um, you know, which is actually quite a big sample. But I remember when I've done fiber typing on my, when I've had fiber typing done on, on my muscle, so one biopsy, it was, I remember one was 572 muscle fibers, you know, because you have it on cross section and you, and you yep. cut 572 muscle fibers. So I want people to realize that even when you have a couple of rice grain size, there's 570 fibers in there. So when we're saying yeah. these are big, they're big compared to other cells, but everything's like tiny, you know? Oh, yeah, so, everything. Um, <laughs> so when you think about these tiny, you got 570 fibers in, in this one biopsy, and then each fiber has hundreds to thousands of nuclei. It's just like, hang on a minute. So anyway, that, yeah. it is mind boggling. <laughs> mind boggling. Yeah. I remember sure. my mum, my mum at one stage, I said to her how uh, red blood cells, I, I, I said there was 6 million red blood cells per cubic millimeter. Uh -huh. And she's like, hang on, what? And I'm like, it's my, like, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. It just blew, blew away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, because then I said each red blood cell has, you know, all these millions of hemoglobin. It's like, oh, no, go away. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of fun to think about. Okay, so these muscle fibers are big in, compared to other fibers, uh, big compared big, to other cells. Big in and the they scale have all these biological things, I guess. <laughs> yes, and they have all these nuclei. Now, why is that important? And, and how are we going to fit that back to muscle memory and things? Sure. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's important, I think, that these muscle fibers have all these nuclei because these nuclei are like, they're the control centers of the cell, right? They're all, the, mm -hmm. of every cell, they're the control center of the cell. So they have all the DNA, which means they express the genes, which become the proteins that mm -hmm. then become the structure of that right. cell Perfect. and function of that cell as well. And so, um, so yeah, having hundreds to thousands of these nuclei mean that like each little, each nucleus has to kind of like govern its own little area. So to say. Mm -hmm. the myonuclear domain, right? And so like maybe there's a hundred nuclei in a given muscle cell and each one controls the area like immediately around it. And then the yeah. one next to it picks up and controls the area that's adjacent to that one. And, mm -hmm. but just so that you can have like an even distribution of gene products, proteins, mRNAs, all these things. And so, um, and it's thought that when the muscle grows that you have to add in these new nuclei um, because the nuclei can't replenish them. So they can't divide. They're, they're what we call post-mitotic. And so they, you know, you can go listen to Benjamin Miller's talk and he'll say some things, but for the most part, they won't divide. Like we don't think they're going to divide. Mm -hmm. They can maybe synthesize DNA, but they can't divide themselves. And so if the muscle were to grow and you needed a new nucleus because the muscle got bigger, um, you'd have to fuse that in from a stem cell or a satellite cell. And so, uh, and they're these cells that all of us have them and they're responsible for injury repair. If you like really severely injured your muscle, the stem cells would activate and would rebuild the muscle. But if with exercise, for instance, if you're growing the muscle, like with hypertrophy, those stem cells would activate and they would donate their nucleus to the muscle fiber so that the muscle fiber can continue to grow. And so that's mm -hmm. sort of the, the thinking. Um, and whether or not that process is necessary for hypertrophy is a long conversation. <laughs> and so I spent a long time studying that. Um, you know, during my postdoc. And so, um, and there's a lot of different opinions. So we can go there later if you want, but for the purposes of muscle memory though. Um, and as you said, so Benjamin Miller talked about that stuff as well. He said, if, if he inhibited satellite cells, um, you know, he got this and that. So people can go and look at that, but yeah, for the purposes of. Hmm? And we can do that. We can delete the stem cells from the muscle altogether and do all types of things. And it's very, very cool. So, um, but yeah, we can definitely talk about that if you want. But um, so hmm. for the sake of muscle memory though, you go to the gym, you lift a weight, your muscle gets bigger. Eventually those stem cells fuse in and then you end up with a bigger muscle fiber that has more nuclei in it. And that's supposed mm -hmm. to be to help your muscle to continue to grow and adapt. Um, and so back to Christian Gunderson, he did a lot of work in 2010 around that time frame using mouse models, rat models, using anabolic steroids, using uh, different sorts of mm -hmm. resistance training analogs and rodents. And, and he came up the, the conclusion that when you gain a nucleus during hypertrophy, uh, if you were to stop training and that same muscle fiber were to atrophy, that nucleus you gained, he said, wouldn't go away. So it's a permanent addition mm -hmm. to the muscle fiber. And because when you start training again, you start with a higher baseline of yeah, nuclei right. fibers, that then you'd be able to grow back more quickly. Okay. And I think, it's, you know, that's Makes clever sense. and that's, it does make sense. I think that's a, a very intuitive uh, sort of, thing that he was able to experimentally in his hand mm. show that that's how that worked. And that was interesting. And so we, but a lot of the experiments that, um, that looked at that specific sort of mechanism, they used surgical models of overload or used again, uh -huh. and different things like that. So we wanted to approach it from a more translatable perspective with our power model. Right. So yeah. you train the mice and we can detrain them and there's no surgeries or drugs or any of these things. And so when we did repeated the study doing training, detraining with what would be a more translatable model, we didn't find that to be the case. We actually found that the nuclei, we don't know how, but the nuclei that you gain during hypertrophy seemed to go away during the detraining. So that we found that like it went back down to baseline levels. <laughs> Which is more pleasing to me anyway, because because your whole <laughs> thing about, I was thinking about, we have a thing around here called Neighborhood Watch, you know, where the people you know keep a watch on their neighborhood. And it was it was making me think somehow that each you know each myonuclei, so each muscle nucleus, is watching its own neighborhood, right? It's, it's looking after yeah. its own turf, right? And, sure. But then if you expand the neighborhood, then you need more neighborhood watch. But if you sh shrink it down, you don't need it again. You know, sorry, we don't yeah. need you guys. And it makes more sense that you that you get rid of the extra nuclei than the, than you keep them because it it doesn't fit with the whole point that you need x amount of nuclei to look after their own area. Right. And it, I mean, the myonuclear domain, as you are sort of expressing right now, 
you know, it, it, it works both ways. You know, it probably works with hypertrophy when the muscle gets bigger, but also with atrophy too, you would think. And I don't That's, know if the time scale mm -hmm. always matches up, you know, like I think probably the muscle fiber would atrophy quicker than you would lose a nucleus. And we don't know how you lose chicken and the egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're, we're still trying to kind of unravel that. And there's people that are going after that question. I think it's fascinating if that process is happening, mm -hmm. how that occurs. Is it like, is it apoptosis of individual nuclei and in nuclear autophagy? Some them. Them. Like there's a lot mm -hmm. of, yeah, well, yeah. Like with apoptosis. So when you say ap terms like apoptosis, just say what that is. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like apoptosis yeah. would be cell death, but in a syncytium. Mm -hmm. So when you have a muscle fiber that has hundreds of nuclei, if you just lose one nucleus, well, the yeah. cell is probably not going to die. So it's like, it's, no. it's nuclear apoptosis, I guess. And so, but um, how that process might occur is, is very much a mystery, I think still at this point. All right. So you're saying but, with, sorry, but with your, see, when you do the strength, well, the, the running wheel, which is overload. So kind of strength training, they get more, they get a hypertrophy and they get more myonuclei, so more muscle yeah. nucleus, which makes sense. But then when you detrain them, you said, unlike Gunderson, is it Gunderson, you didn't, he kept his kept then myonuclei even with the detraining. So when they uh, they lost their hypertrophy, but you didn't lose yours. Is that right? And that's that slow and fast fibers. In the plantaris muscle, we did not see. In the soleus, again, they didn't. The muscle didn't detrain. So in that instance, they instant, stayed. They stayed. Okay. So we well, like, that's okay, a nice I, control then. That's a nice I, control I, for your for your model. It was because in that sense, yeah. Yeah, because uh -huh. you might say, oh, there's just technical differences or something. But the fact that you you had the soleus that didn't detrain and they kept their myonuclei and the plantaris that did detrain and they lost their myonuclei, that's a nice control. And we did that several different ways too. We isolated out individual fibers and counted nuclei like longitudinally on the whole muscle mm. fiber or portion, portion of the muscle fiber. And we did it with histology as well, which is another popular way to like measure these things. And so we did it a couple different ways. We got the same result. So our... Um, conclusion from at least these mouse studies was that, that this hypothesis may be a little more nuanced um, and maybe there's more conversation to be had about what a potential muscle memory mechanism could be because if it's not a maintenance of the myonuclei that you gained from hypertrophy, perhaps it's a difference within the myonuclei that are there. Um, that was kind of yeah, our right. thought process. Maybe that okay. could, could be related okay. to Okay, all right. So I, man I, I managed to sort of confuse things slightly there. So I think it, it's nice. Uh, sorry, you're finding that you have hypertrophy, you get more myonuclei, and then you, if you detrain, you lose it. Makes sense in terms of the myonuclear domain and looking after the neighborhood and all that. But it doesn't help explain your muscle memory thing. So you're saying you were thinking – as Gunderson showed, I guess that that yeah, if you train, you get more myonuclei. You detrain, you lose. Uh, you you keep them, and then you train again. So maybe that's why you do better. So you're saying because you didn't see that, it seems like maybe that is not the reason in terms of the number of myonuclei, but maybe the myonuclei that are already there are more sort of ready to go. Sure. Yeah. More I ready to it. express genes. Yeah. Yeah, that was our hypothesis, and that was you know kind of the the hypothesis that. I mentioned Adam Sharples when he did like, that's what they were looking. They weren't looking at nuclear numbers. They were looking at epigenetic changes. Epigenetic. Perfect. So that brings us to epigenetic. So then you're saying, okay, so maybe there's epigenetic changes so that the, the genes that are there, you don't have more total genetic material because you don't have more myonuclei, but the myonuclei that are there. So the genetic material that's there already is more likely to turn on. So, so oh, quicker turns on quicker or, or to a greater extent, in response to the second lot of training, yeah? So the muscle Perfect. memory. That was, that was sort of our, our thinking. Yeah, that's what we wanted to kind of right. get trying. Now, do you have any evidence for that? Yeah, so we did a study to kind of try and suss this out a little bit where um, we were interested in looking at the myonuclei now, but we're interested in doing some molecular measures of them. You know, so not necessarily counting their numbers, but isolating the nuclei out and mm. then doing some different sort that's of assays cool. to say, Okay, maybe there is like an epigenetic and epi memory mm. of the of the previously trained state that remains when you are retraining. And so we uh, we had a mouse model where we could genetically label the muscle fiber nuclei, the myonuclei with a, a green fluorescent protein. So just just to make them turn green so that we could identify them. Then we just do some different biochemical sort of assays to isolate out these fluorescent nuclei. And then we looked at the epigenetic profile of the myonuclei 
um, after the detraining period to see if there was like a, a memory of, of what the training yeah. state looks like at the epigenetic level. So looking mm -hmm. at like essentially gene accessibility, we'll say for in layman's terms and mm -hmm. found that, yeah, there were some genes that kind of had a profile that would be suggestive of, they still kind of had their, their trained phenotype, so to say. So okay. they had epigenetic marks around them that would suggest that perhaps they could be activated more quickly or more readily to help facilitate a retraining response that would maybe drive um, greater hypertrophy with retraining. And this dovetailed with other work done by Adam Sharples and some other folks mm -hmm. that found a very similar thing, that there may be this memory of the trained state in the myonuclei, presumably, but also that, you know, there could be even be like a like a more dramatic gene expression like response with the retraining that would help facilitate the muscle growing back more quickly. And so that was kind of in broad strokes what we what we sort of found with uh with these studies that we're doing. And we're still kind of going after this and trying to understand on a deeper level like which epigenetic layers potentially could be important for, you know, driving regrowth. Um and we actually we did all these studies with looking specifically at the myonuclei, but we did some other things too, where we were looking at like different types of transcripts or messages that are produced by the nuclei. And we found that there's a specific microRNA that also stays repressed during the detraining period. So when you train, this microRNA goes down. I can tell you what a microRNA is, but um, it's basically a small, a small um, RNA that binds to other larger RNAs mm -hmm, and you mm -hmm. cause them to not get turned into protein or to degrade. Um, so basically as a way of fine tuning what genes get get made into proteins, um, we found that there was a, a change in this microRNA profile that was persistent throughout the entire detraining period. Um, so out to like 12 weeks. And we thought that was interesting and that it may be related to how the muscle is more responsive to the okay. retraining. And so we did a couple different things and we're still not hundred percent sure it's hard to link these things mechanistically, right? These are associations still, even though we're doing kind of some sophisticated molecular work. I'll do a summary still... thing just before you go that next okay, step. Absolutely. I just want to make sure people are... Okay, so just want to make sure tie in again because the epigenetics thing is, is still a bit new to people. So you know how we, we talked earlier about um, how, you know, your genes don't really change during your lifetime when they don't get changed passing on, you know, to generations, but the likelihood of these genes turning on. So, so these, these epigenetic markers, yeah. So, you know, you touched on a few things earlier, but we won't get into that too much, you know, methylation and all that. So these epigenetic markers may still, which, which affect the likelihood to turn on or turn off. It sounds like some of those and ones that you think are important for hypertrophy, they, the genes that are that are important for hypertrophy, some of them have these epigenetic markers on them still after the detraining, yeah, and they didn't change. So then it's more likely they're going to turn on again. Is that what you're saying? Sure, sure. I think yep. that's a fair assessment. Yeah, I think that right. uh, pretty sums up pretty well. Yep. All right, and perfect. And and sorry, can I say, do they turn on more? So when you have these, you got okay, this gene has a marker on it that makes it that we think is going to make it more likely to turn on again. But then when you do the detraining, uh, the retraining, so when you go and train them again, do those genes turn on again? And uh, in our study, ours wasn't, for the mouse studies, we weren't didn't set it up to, to answer that question because we didn't have like an, a, an acute exercise bout in each state. So we didn't have them like do a, a bout of exercise and look at their gene expression response. Um, it would have just been, we would have had to kill too many mice to pull right. that off. And so mm. we just looked at the ultimate outcome, but other studies like um, Adam's study did okay. not mistaken show that some of those genes that have those, that memory are more responsive in the trained state okay. to like a bout okay. of exercise. And that's probably really where it's coming in is like each bout of exercise, you're getting that like little extra something <laughs> from uh, having that, you know, epigenetic memory that's ultimately contributing additively to the bigger yeah, response. and this this actually reminds me because you know my main background is being glucose metabolism, and it and it maybe explains the thing. So there's a glucose transporter which I'm, I know you're aware of. I'm just telling the audience uh, called GLUT4. So you know it moves to the membrane and brings in glucose. Yeah. So when you contract, the transporter moves to the membrane, brings in the glucose. It can also do it in response to insulin. Insulin. Glute 4 moves the membrane, brings in the glucose, right? Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that each bout of exercise, your glute 4 expression goes up and then comes down again. 
but it tends to be kind of additive. So you know, it's going up. So if people aren't watching YouTube, they won't see the, the um, yeah, because a lot of people do Spotify. <laughs> But, yeah. you know, it's it's going up, it's coming down, but not all the way down again. And then you do your next bout that comes up and it goes down, but not quite down again. And this is the, the messenger RNA, which we sort of started talking about. So the gene, the DNA gets converted to messenger. Well, it turns on messenger RNA, which then causes a protein. Um, okay, transfer RNA. And then you end up with the protein, which is GLUT4. Yeah. And this message from each bout the messenger RNA is going up and then coming down. So anyway, it's not going down. So I'm wondering, you know, maybe that's an example of epigenetics. So the fact that training is, you know, sometimes we say that training is a series of single exercise belts, right? And sure. it's always, yeah. I've always thought about this and I thought, hang on a minute, but it's additive. So maybe this epigenetics going on there. So I don't know if you want to say in your own words, that what you were starting to say as well, to fill in the gaps for people that just like I tried to fill in the gaps, maybe you fill in some more gaps. Yeah. I think it's probably, as you say, related to that, like every exercise bout is contributing to the ultimate outcome. And like, yeah, with each exercise bout, if you had, if you started in a slightly different, let's just say more favorable place epigenetically, you're able to access those genes mm. more quickly. It's really cool. Back a messenger mm. RNA that then becomes a protein. So you ultimately end up with more of the protein after each repeated bout, and then you get a greater adaptive response after a period of time. So eight weeks, 12 weeks, what have you. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, intuitively what I would think is happening, but I haven't tested that specific hypothesis, but I can kind of draw from other areas of literature, other studies to point that that could be problem, a potential explanation. And it could be related to epigenetics. It could be related to these changes in microRNAs that are maybe long lasting. It could probably, if I had to guess, it's some memory is probably happening at a variety of different levels and how long that memory lasts is yes. well, other can of worms. I don't All know. Right. And that's partly why I've kind of pulled you back a little bit because I just felt like we might have been getting away. So I, I don't want to um, cut off the microRNA bit, but I just want to make sure people were oh, aware. Okay. You've got the DNA, the messenger RNA, the transfer RNA, and then you end up with a protein. Why don't you tell us now, just again, kind of basically, but what the microRNA business is and what you found? Sure. So within the, the, the framework of the study design with the mice I've been talking about. So we train the mice and then we detrain the mice. Um, and then we look to see what things are potentially long lasting after the training has mm -hmm. ceased. Um, and we measured a variety of things, as you say, mRNAs. Um, but another thing we looked at was microRNAs, which are basically these really kind of short RNAs that um, get generated, you know, from the same genetic code from our DNA, they come from there. And, um, Sometimes they even embedded in other genes and they get processed and become these little kind of like free floating little um, RNAs that can then go interact with the messenger RNAs. So they basically kind of have a mate or maybe a lot of mates because it's a little sequence that it is comprised of and it'll go and interact with a messenger RNA or maybe a lot of different messenger RNAs and either stop them from becoming proteins um, by preventing them from being translated or degrading them so they don't have a chance to get translated. And so it's sort of a way to, to fine tune. So you may express a gene and that would be signal intent for it to become a protein. It doesn't always, right? It's not a one-to-one, -one, like a gene get expressed becomes a protein. It's not like always that linear. <laughs> There's some nuance there. Um, but it's another way in which like, okay, let's say a gene got expressed, but then the cell didn't need it. The microRNA could come in, bind to it, signal for it to get degraded, and okay. it doesn't become protein. That's that. Nice. And mm -hmm. so, um, but it, we can, we consider microRNAs generally to be repressors, um, you know, because they're going to shut down the translation of a specific mRNA. Um, it can have a variety of different biological effects, of course, but we found that there was a specific microRNA, which is enriched in muscle um, specifically. It's called a myomere. So myo, the prefix being microRNA mere. We found one of these myomeres, it went down with exercise training, and then okay. it stayed down for like a very long period of time after training. Uh, okay. We think okay. that, that microRNA could have been like serving as a break on certain transcripts that were related to growth. And then if that break is already off, when you start training again, it could okay. be easier for you to okay. get a response. So another kind of molecular layer, which okay. this retraining response, muscle memory response could be working. And like I said, I think it's probably working on several different layers. 
Okay. And and as you said, microRNAs have lots of mates. So they they tend to affect more than one gene or protein. Yeah. Again, did it make sense, you know, like when you actually look at the proteins? Because, I mean, in, in some ways it's easy to say, oh, this was down, therefore, whatever. But did the proteins that it interacts with, did that fit with your hypothesis as well? It, well, because it's MIR-1 and it te seems to target things that are specifically related to growth, like IGF-1 and different, like, okay. growth oriented sort of proteins. Yeah, the fact that MIR-1 was down was could have been indicative of that. It was serving as a break for some of these growth-oriented processes but then you just remove that break and then when you introduce the stimulus exercise retraining then the muscle Perfect. can sort of take off again so we did we did hypothesize that we did present that as our explanation yeah. but okay we did some computational analysis but we didn't go in um, and actually now we have a way of testing this so this is something i'm actively working on but um but at that time it was just a hypothesis and it still is to an extent but we are working no, i think it's stuff. really cool stuff really cool stuff now you emailed me at one stage saying um you're introducing a new mouse model which we've yet we've discussed and challenges some widely held beliefs on muscle memory so maybe just circle around again so um so you're saying it looks like it's more maybe epigenetic and not so much the myo but as you say there's probably layers of what are we what are we challenging here that the hide take us back to the widely held beliefs sure, so a lot they were again. with muscle memory the widely held belief i think was that if you gained a nucleus from a satellite cell that was permanent like so if the muscle atrophied okay. you would have like a hyper we'll I'll call it hyper nucleated muscle fiber okay, so if that's muscle fiber had 100 nuclei maybe now it has 125 but it's still back to the size that it was but it just has more nuclei so it can take off faster when you retrain and i don't want to discount that hypothesis i think in some instances that could maybe it's muscle type dependent maybe it depends on the age at which you started exercising so if it was like a younger animal that you exercise maybe that's when that mechanism becomes really operational mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot of considerations here. I'm not trying to discard no, that no. hypothesis. Now, another um, thing I've, sorry, another thing, yeah, I realized we, we pretty much covered that. Another thing I realized was, um, I guess we're, we're doing a very DNA centric, um, although you did touch on breakdown as well. I, I wonder if there's other epigenetic things that are going on. So, you know, we've, we t tend to talk, you know, same when you talk about protein synthesis, you tend to th think about when you think about protein levels, you tend to think about the synthesis and it's like, yeah. oh, it's a bit harder to measure the breakdown, you know? So I'm wondering yeah. if it's the same thing. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's the same thing here where we, it's, it's maybe a bit easier to think about the synthesis of the protein and not the breakdown. So wonder if there's an epigenetic thing going on as well with the muscle memory where your lysosome or, you know, or, or even breaking down, we haven't talked about the mitochondria, but just the, the breaking down side there might be a memory. So it's like, okay, we've made these proteins. Let's not break them down as quickly the second time. Right. It very well could be. Um, I mean, I would be inclined to think that if you did lose a nucleus, you would maybe lose some of the other, like, cause you can lose mitochondria as you kind of pointed to like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, if you stop training, you lose mitochondria. Um, and it, I think it stands to reason that if you stopped resistance training, you could lose a nucleus too. I mean, mitochondria have their own DNA as well. <laughs> and yeah, so, that's true. And so um, I think DNA or nuclei could be the same. Um, yeah, I mean, it could very well be related to some breakdown process that I haven't thought about, but I'd be inclined to think that the muscle would probably be maintaining something in the DNA um, because there's so many nuclei. I guess it goes back to DNA. But I guess what I'm getting at is um, the, the muscle memory part that, mm -hmm. that maybe the lysosomes or whatever it is, it's breaking down proteins. Maybe they have a memory. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. So like maybe so they're less they, likely to break it down. Hmm. Yeah, potentially. Um, I, what, I guess what I can say with muscle memory from what I've read, I don't think people have really done much. Well, I guess in the sense that like fiber type changes back, at least in the plantaris changes back to, um, you know, it's baseline phenotype and that's a protein measure when we measure fiber type. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I I just don't know enough about that, nor have I seen any evidence to suggest no, that. No, no, just something I threw out there. Just, yeah. I don't want to go out on a crazy limb because I really don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not suggesting you know that, but I'm just, I guess, 
Well, you know, like like I said, with with protein levels for, for years and years, it was just protein synthesis, protein synthesis, protein synthesis. But but then it's been like, oh, hang on, what about the breakdown? You know, so just to make sure people are clear what I'm talking about. So just say you do weight training, you get an increase in your uh, muscle mass, your hypertrophy, and you say, oh, there's a, been an increase in muscle um, protein synthesis. But in theory, you could get an increase in your muscle mass by just not changing your protein synthesis, but reducing the protein breakdown. So I just have sure. to make sure people are clear on that. I think in that instance, though, like at least with that example, though, like you, you do want, of course you want protein turnover, right? Like I think it, it just from, you know, global perspective, like, you know, keeping bad stuff around. Yeah, you don't want to keep bad stuff. Would be, yeah, that would, that would it could yeah, be yeah. counter potentially. And that's just more for like the audience, you know, like, yeah, exactly. you always need to be two sides of these equations. So you could absolutely reduce breakdown, but that might get you an undesirable exactly. result. But, yeah, but so. What's probably more likely happen when you're hypertrophy is you get an increase in protein synthesis and maybe the increase in protein synthesis is greater than the increase in breakdown. And then you get bigger. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, cool. Actually when you eat. Exactly. Now, yeah, exactly. Now the other thing I, I guess I wondered about was um, I guess it's too early to know, but you know, if you strength train and then 20 years later, you know, and then you stop and then 20 years later you do it again and there's there this muscle memory. Uh, and then if you endurance train 20 years later, you do it again. Do we know the, you know, which is more likely to have muscle memory, you know, strength versus endurance or, and also, I guess we touched on it earlier, how long, you know, it might last. So if you stop for 20 years, 30 years, five years, six months. Yeah. yeah so I think the answer, to the endurance versus the resistance, I'll speculate. Um, the studies that have looked at the memory from endurance training, versus the memory from his resistance training. I think that studies have shown, looked at like memory, either like the transcriptional level or even maybe at the epigenetic level, don't show it to be as prevalent as what you get with resistance training. Now, I will admit that my power model, our power it's model, both. Mm. Is a combination. And so, but mm. I'm based on inferring from other literature would would think that it's perhaps more the the consequence of the hypertrophy component as it is from the endurance component at least that's my sort of leaning at the moment um so i think maybe the memory component could be more linked to a hypertrophic sort of stimulus potentially um and as far as how long which is i mean a very relevant question um and the answer is I'm not sure because no one's done like a time course in humans, but I can say that at least back to our closing the loop on our conversation, as far as the, you know, the lifespan of a mouse, mm. you know, when we detrain a mouse for 12 weeks, that's like a long time in the life of a mouse yes. and so still see some of these things persisting. And so, yeah, I'm looking at the study design of the muscle memory study and we detrained our mice for 12 weeks and okay. then retrain them. Mm -hmm. It was 12 weeks. And so um, that's a pretty long time <laughs> in the lifespan of a mouse. Now, how that relates to a human being, I, I don't know. And I think that comes back to those anecdotes that maybe former athletes say where it's like, ah, I was, you know, I was an athlete in college and then I stopped and I got into the working world and I didn't, you know, lift weights forever. Mm -hmm. But then I got back in the gym and it's like, you know, second nature and the muscle came yeah, back. Exactly. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's an anecdote. So take that for what it's worth. I guess you've got a, a million studies to do, but it would be nice if you did a running wheel without the weighted. Because again, I'm I showing my endurance bias here. Um, and, and just see if they do have that muscle memory. Because part of me thought, well, hang on, maybe it's more likely to be endurance because the slow fibers didn't didn't go back. You know what I mean? The fast fibers did. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, it's a fair question. I've been told many times before, why didn't you have a non-weighted wheel? I was like, because I only have- No, 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 no. I think it's good. <laughs> and you wouldn't, maybe wouldn't have got, if you did a non-weighted wheel, maybe, and it, and it only really happens with, with weight training, you may have missed it, right? So I think it's, I think it's great. Now, the other, I just realized the other thing. So when we talk about these, you know, uh, j just to explain more about the lifespan of a of a rodent versus a human. So, because we're often doing developmental stuff, so we're yeah. so the rats, for example, to so give people an idea, the rats would wean at three and a half weeks. Okay, mm -hmm. so humans yeah. do not wean at three and a half weeks, six months or something. So, just to give people an idea of the difference, and their total lifespan is about two years or something, um, which is obviously very short. So, just just again backing that up. Now, I wonder, the other thing, I guess, is how much training do you need to then get 
the muscle memory effects. So obviously if you just did one bout, you wouldn't expect, you know, that the, even if you get epigenetic markers, you probably think they'd wear off, you know? So again, it's like the more you do, the more likely you, you get to get the muscle memory, I guess. That would be my inclination, but I mean, even at, I'm not going to say an acute bout of exercise long, is enough to see this long lasting change, but an acute bout of exercise can change epigenetic marks. And it does. Absolutely. We think, and so, mm -hmm evidence for that and so yeah i mean how many it takes to like lock in <laughs> i guess the epigenetic change if you know there is a long lasting one how long it takes to lock it in i don't know it's a good question um i mean at least in our study obviously with the power train they were training a lot you know we said that yeah. eight to twelve kilometers yeah, a lot. lot but you know human studies that have done this have been much more reasonable like you know three mm -hmm. days a week of resistance training you know yeah. three sets of yeah. ten type of stuff and, you know, they still see some of these responses. So you can scale it back relatively pretty significantly and still see some of these responses. But as far as like, you know, would two weeks of five minutes a day of hit be enough, like high intensity interval training or something like that? I don't know. Uh, people haven't done those studies yet that I'm aware of. So yeah. It's interesting. The other thing that makes things complicated is um is specificity because you know, we know if you do weight training versus versus training. It's very specific. So if you did like isometric, so where your muscles not not um, changing length, I think it's been found. I, I, I know it had been found. I don't know if it's been backed up later on, but you only get strength gains in sort of like ten degrees either side of that. Like you don't get it throughout the full range. So I'm just thinking, you know, and then more specific stuff like eccentric contractions versus concentric contractions and things like that. You tend to get specific adaptations. Yeah, and it's hard to think how that would fit. You know what I mean? Like. Like you wouldn't, how would you pick that up in the muscle fiber to then go, oh, I did concentric training, which is muscle shortening. And then 10 years later, I did eccentric training. Do I get muscle memory? You know what I mean? Yeah, it would be exceedingly difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> That's pretty cool to think about though. Uh, I wasn't expecting you to know the answer to that one, but just, just I think it's just an extra layer of um, complexity. All right, so what are we going doing here? I just want to make a look at my notes. I think we've got through quite a lot. It's been great, actually. I've enjoyed it. Uh, do you have any thoughts, uh, other stuff we haven't talked about? Or ah, now I had, I had this, I had this, I had this in my notes, and you actually nature or nurture or nature and nurture. Now I reckon that that is very cool. So talking about so nature is sort of your genetics. Nurtures your epigenetics in, a, in the way that we've been talking. Because I always sure. thought, because the best journal in the world is called Nature. Yeah? yeah. And then you talk about everyone always says, is it nature or nurture? I reckon a great journal would be Nature and Nurture. So it's <laughs> genetics and counterpoint, just nurture, and then maybe a nature and nurture. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, okay. So we have we covered everything. So Another thing I was going to mention, I guess the, the epigenetics thing is a classic, is the Dutch famine. So if people want to think about something you could maybe relate to more. So during the Second World War, Dutch famine, you know, the, the Dutch weren't able to get enough food in. And then you see the epigenetics because you see um, across time that the, the generations, several generations on, are still affected by that, that uh, insufficient food. Uh, back yep. uh, way back then. So it's just another example I had. Okay, I'll let you answer now. Have we covered everything that we wanted to cover? Do you think? Uh, I think I think mostly. Yeah, I think we we covered an awful lot of ground. Uh, yeah, we didn't talk too much about you know satellite cells and stuff, but I feel like that's a that's a whole other podcast. I sort of think. And so, okay. And I, you know what? When Chris Fry comes on, you should ask him because he would be the perfect guy to chat about that with. So I can pass that one off to. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now we did have one you had uh because I like to ask about effective age, effects sex differences and things. You you did have one, I think, effects of age on some of this or uh effects of age. Well, as far as muscle memory, I mean I know that there was a study that was done where they they tried to look at this muscle memory idea in young versus age. And there was a very small sample size, um, but they had folks train and retrain young and old and found that at least when you're old, older, is that the proper thing to say? Uh, if you're, no. if you're age, an age challenged, person, uh, yeah, <laughs> age, a person mm -hmm. of an older age, um, wise as a person who studies age, mm -hmm. you know more about the 
terminology. No, but, um, it's hard. But it yeah, cha- things change all the time, as you know. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, a person that that's uh, older in age uh, would still have the ability to well get adaptations from the training initially, but also have a muscle memory effect. And it seems like whether you're younger or older or, or older, there's still this like sort of amplified response to the retraining. And so in that sense, um, it seems like it could be you know a conserved thing across the lifespan. But again, it's like going back to the mm-hmm. question of when the initial training was, and then how long you waited. Was it, mm-hmm. was it you know two months or 20 years like these are all very very open-ended mm-hmm. questions at the moment. we may not even no, know the answer so, i guess um, no one's looked at sex differences so what what did you have both sexes of my saw because again you got to double everything but um or did you have males yeah. or... so for most of the studies for our exercise training do you train stuff we use females because they tend to run better and run more they tend to be more consistent with their running and so it's more of a practical consideration the females just take to it better and perform better for the the epigenetic studies i'm talking about the at least the one where we looked at dna methylation and the myonuclei and isolate the myonuclei and things like that we used male mice because i had used all my female mice for other studies and so um so i was left okay. with the male well, we're going to run it with the males. And we did, and they still ran, they ran less than the females. But as far as like, have we looked at sex differences between them? No, we haven't. Um, To be determined. (laughs) Okay, great. All right. Well, this has been great, but while I've got you, I can't help noticing you've, you had in your CV and things, some of these uh, articles where you sort of lay type articles you've had. And I, I couldn't help one jumped out at me busting muscle, myths paper so just why we've got you because i know we could get you for a whole satellite cell thing as well but i'm interested about this we address common misconceptions misconceptions including the go big or go home and if you don't use it use it you lose it approaches ah okay so if you don't use it don't use it you lose it i guess you're saying it's part of the the muscle memory side yeah but i guess you'd still agree that if you don't use it i guess you'd still agree that if you don't use it you lose it to some extent, but yeah, but just, you do, but yeah. you might get it, you might get it back faster. Yeah. So that was sort of the the message there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, if you're a soleus of a mouse, maybe you don't lose it. I don't know. But yeah, exactly. Um, but, but yeah. But that that paper was, you know, just something fun that yeah, yeah, I get it now. Mind. I get it now. That I yep. The authors there, the other ones, uh, Dr. Jimmy Bagley and Dr. Andy Galpin, they did a really cool study on nature versus nurture where they had like um it was a twin study where they had identical twins, one was a lifelong um was a lifelong uh triathlete and the other one was like a truck driver like never exercised okay. at all but they were mm-hmm. genetically identical and they yes. were like a really interesting study and show like how radically different their fiber type was and like you know the mm-hmm. genetic determinant of fiber type versus how much okay. you can swing it on exercise and really cool. interesting so yeah you're saying nature versus nurture it makes me there think that that's it was just such a striking example of how powerful exercise is, you know, the phenotype is radically different. It's a published study. It was published a couple of years ago. Oh, so cool. it's, uh, it's very, very, very cool. So, and yeah. the go big or go home, I guess. Um, what were you thinking there? I guess. Oh, that was, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the Stu Phillips, uh, sort of, uh, message that, you know, you don't necessarily have to exactly. live super, super quick time to, to put on. Exactly. Like exactly. So, so these are good because you don't want to be scaring people off. Like, oh, you know, it's 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 not worth going to the gym unless I just smash myself every day and whatever. Which is it's exactly what we don't want people to be thinking because then they just get sore and they give up. True. Yep. <laughs> All right. Now, what I do have is something I threw uh, sent to you beforehand. Was uh, part of the idea of inside exercise is because we want people to get their information from the experts rather than from influencers. And I like asking people uh, more recently. Is there something, you know, this is your chance to sort of take on these influences that are sort of peddling misinformation. And now I know you said you don't really, you know, follow influences, which is probably wise. But um, <laughs> although someone said I'm becoming an influencer and it's like, well, no, I'm not because, okay, let me, let me, in case people are wondering about this, even if this podcast got to a million views, I still wouldn't consider myself an influencer because I'm not giving my own opinion. You know, obviously it comes out here and there, but I'm not like going off and like a lot of podcasters and just rattling on about stuff that I'm not an expert in. I tend sure. to get my information from experts and I try and get people to get their information from the experts. And I don't like give my own theories at the end or whatever. So I'd like to think I'm not an influencer, but 
Um, what, what, you know, is there something that cheeses you off that, um, that you, you hear bandied around? Sure. And yeah, like I, I reiterate, I don't really follow influencers on fitness, the fitness realm per se. So, um, but I will say it makes me just reflect on the question of what is an expert? Um, because I've thought about this quite a bit. And it's like, there's a, I think there are certain a couple people that I follow, you know, and have interesting content, this and that. But, you know, like just because someone can read a research paper and interpret it doesn't make them an expert. You know, a lot of people, no. they're, they're, they make a whole shtick out of, you know, uh, what's evidence based. We're evidence based. We read the literature, this and that. And that's wonderful. Evidence based is great. But, but, um, but, you know, just because you can read a paper and interpret it better than somebody who doesn't read the literature doesn't make them an expert in that. You know, like I think no. about, what makes anybody on this podcast an expert is the fact that they know the field and that involves reading, of course. Um, you have to read the papers. But the other part of it is being able to identify when a study is appropriate or good or bad or whether the methods were done correctly. Because I mean, you can have this wonderful, seemingly wonderful study that has all these amazing findings, but if all the methods were done poorly and you can mm -hmm. identify that, then the study's not worth very much. And so, and I think that's a lot of times where an influencer will go astray is They'll see a study come out. They don't know anything about the authors or the journal or the methods because they've never done the, any sort of mm -hmm. research themselves. And then they say, this is the state of the literature. And it's like, well, that's the state of one study. And it was one study that was exactly. conducted. Before. So I'm not so sure that that's a good message. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I You're living and breathing this stuff for like, you know, 10 years, 20 years, whatever. You can't just yeah. read a few papers. And that's the thing that gets, because literally people will say to me, why don't you, you know, just, just take a few days, read up in an area, and then do a podcast and just talk about the area. And it's like, well, because I'm not going to be an expert. Oh, yeah, but you'll know more than 99% of the audience. Sure. But sure. why don't I just but interview the expert? And I won't yeah. name names, but there's all these huge podcasters and people that they just, I don't, I don't get how they do it. So there's one guy in particular, you know, he's a, whatever he is. He talks, you know, sure, okay, you've got your own area, but you can't talk about 20 different areas. But these people are just massive, massive. The devil's anyway. in the details, like as with anything, you know, and I, 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 me and any other person that studies the things I study knows how, has a sense of how methods should be conducted and how assays hmm. should be done and yet all these different, oh no, just so many experimental considerations hmm. for anybody that's an expert in an area. And we're always thinking about these things and there's no way an influencer exactly. could know things they just can't and so not to That's discount right. mm. what they're trying to do i think it can be a net positive but sometimes it isn't when well, it's... they get things wrong it's a problem yeah and, and they're often trying to flog supplements as well <laughs> <laughs> yes, i can't yeah. help myself okay <laughs> so um that's great now is there anything um else anything well okay because then you'll get into satellite cells i was going to say is other stuff you're working on that you're excited about but i think uh we want to wrap that up because i think it's clear that you would like to talk about stuff like that now um all right. So, how about we finish up with some some takeaway messages? So, you know, when you give a give a talk, you think, "Oh, there's, there's two or three things I want people to take away from this." Some takeaway messages to to wrap up. Sure. Um, you know, uh, it's important to consider, you know, the experimental design of a mouse versus a human, and these different the different things that go into um, a human study versus a mouse study, and the different considerations. It's always important to view what you're listening to or what you're reading within that lab. Um, in the context of muscle memory, you know, um, there's evidence to suggest that it could be related to the number of myonuclei that you gain and have upon retraining, but it could also be related to a variety of other factors. It could be related to epigenetics or microRNAs or things that we haven't even measured. But I think the idea that if you were to detrain and take some time off and then start training again, there's a chance that it might come back a little easier the second time. And there could be a variety of reasons for why that is. And so, um, I, and that's kind of the area that we're working on. We're interested in and knowing, knowing more about. And so I think, uh, that probably captures the high points of our talk. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah. And the evidence is pretty clear that the muscle, because I have to admit when I first looked at this area, I thought, well, was that really a thing or not? But so the, the evidence, even though there hasn't been a whole bunch done, you think it's pretty clear because I know you've done mice, but but even in humans as well, that muscle memory is a thing. So if you do exercise training, especially uh, we know more about strength, you know more about strength training, then I don't know, six months, two years, 10 years later, you do it again. It is likely you will take to it uh, quicker and get bigger or, or better quicker 
and it will be in the muscle. It's not just the motor learning. It's not just the fact you know what you're doing. And I'll say that the motor learning and stuff doesn't contribute. It probably does. But, you know, yeah, we think that that's probably the case. And I mean, I don't think that gives you license to, okay, I used to lift 175 pounds on the bench. I'm just going to jump right back into that. You know, like not a good idea. You know, like you probably want to have some common sense here. But, you know, if you follow a pretty appropriate prescription, yeah, there's a decent chance that you might, you know, that muscle might come back a little bit quicker. You might get stronger a little faster. Um, but also, you know, just the idea that, yeah, if you have to take time off, it's not a death sentence, you know, like you can get back into it and it can still have benefits and maybe they'll even be come back faster that second time potentially. And that's great, you know? And so, you know, don't give up. Actually, I sorry, I was just about to finish now. I, I often do this. I do the takeaway messages and I have something else. Just thinking, what about the health benefits? You know, so we often, you know, we talk about the hypertrophy and all that, but we know that strength training, endurance training, both of them improve, you know, your, glucose regulation and, and all sorts of health benefits, blood pressure and things sure. like that. Do we know if they stick around a bit? Um, Boy, hmm. that's a great question. I yeah. don't know. Cause I've been so in the muscle and so in the yeah. cell that I, about the more important things. Uh, yeah. That's a good, at least with resistance training. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I haven't looked into that. That's a good question. Uh, It'd be interesting so to I'm, see I'm, if they, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I would think that with, the D train from like aerobic training, some of that would last a little while, but I don't know how long. I don't know. Good question. Good question, Glenn. <laughs> well, and, and then I guess, I mean, you are going to lose some of those health benefits, but whether they come back quicker as well, you know, so maybe you sure. get the, the drop in your blood pressure and improvement in your glucose tolerance and all that. Maybe that comes back quicker as well. Actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, they haven't already. <laughs> health, health, not just muscle, but um, whole body health memory or something okay all right well thanks thanks again for coming on so so you're definitely a rising star and um one thing is you know you think oh maybe they won't know their stuff as much as someone who's been around for 20 30 years so you obviously know your stuff really well and i think i was actually thinking um that you're a good example of how i couldn't just go and and you know to tie it in what, what we said before i could spend a week two weeks three weeks reading up on this stuff and there's no way i can do what you did right so that's the whole yeah. idea You've got to interview the experts. Okay. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a huge, very flattering because your podcast mm -hmm. has had like juggernauts in the field and it's yeah. really cool to count it among them now. So it's really flattering for me. So thank you for the for the honor. And uh, I hope that this is beneficial to people. I'm, I'm sure, sure it will be. Will listen, so. <laughs> okay. Well, good on you, mate. See you. See you around. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah, bye. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And please like, subscribe, Pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.